Well, hi, everybody, and welcome to episode 189 of Level Up. 60 minutes, of course, of live Q&A, where your questions really do drive the show. Now, if you're joining us on YouTube today, you can find out much more about what we do in our channel. So do please give this video a like and subscribe so that you can find out more and not miss out on any new content. All of that good stuff. Ella is actually over in the social chat. So do please let her know your name and of course the city from where you're joining. She's going to post a link into the chat for you to be able to vote up the questions that you would most like answered and of course for you to add your own as well. Now, if your question's selected, your name's going to appear in the credits at the end of the show. So do get those questions in early and stay with us to see all of that happening. Collaboration, of course, improves the ways that teams work and solve problems and um, never more so actually than in the world of project management. Um, so many different aspects of work now are delivered via projects, um, whether they're small engagements or large complex programs or even portfolios of projects which are being managed. And they really do form the heart of innovation and the way in which things get done and get changed um, throughout organisations, whether you're in the public or indeed the private sector. But how do you go about becoming really great as a project manager, when there are so many different aspects and elements to doing that role really, really well. Well, to help us figure all of that out for today are an amazing panel. So let's jump in and meet them all. Uh, Christina Sear Peterson is an award winning executive director of the Half Double Institute and the co founder actually of the Half Double methodology itself, with a passion to help improve project performance all over the world. Christina is determined to help the industry improve outcomes for everybody. Welcome to Level Up, Christina. Great to have you on the show. Thank you. Great to be here. Okay, thanks very much indeed. Laurie Bowman rejoins us today. He's, of course, Head of Project Portfolio Planning and Control over at Synchrony Projects and has a background in engineering and construction, regular contributor to Level Up. Welcome back to the show, Laurie. Great to see you today. Uh, thank you, Nick. Very good to be here. Welcome, fellow panellists and uh, listeners. Okay, thanks so much indeed. Ashish Garg is, a, you may remember, a regular contributor to um, Level Up. He's also the general manager over at HCL Technologies, where he leads teams to deliver technology for major clients. He's an expert in complex multi-site, multi-country implementations. Um, he enjoys the challenges that those uh, projects bring and and really delivering value for his customers. So welcome back to the show, Ashish. Thank you, Nick. It's always fun to be here uh, with you know amazing people and obviously live uh, audience. So good to be here again. Absolutely. Ron Lehman, he's the founder of the Highway of Change, where he works to share his experience in a very down-to-earth practical format with others around the world so that they can really relate to it and take that advice and guidance on board. He's an award-winning contributor to the HRD Congress, and Ron is also a regular contributor as well. Welcome back, Ron. Thank you very much. Uh, I was only here about a couple of weeks ago, so it seems like I haven't even <laughs> moved on yet. So thank you. Okay, all right, no problem. Completing our panel today is Gregory Petzer. He's a student support manager over at IT Online Learning, where he aids practicing professionals to gain new qualifications and develop their careers. Passionate about improving learning outcomes, Gregory's work spans the private sector and the public through volunteering. Um, he's also supported nonprofit work for um, people like refugees and so on in tricky circumstances. So. Um, thank you for doing that, Gregory, and welcome to Level Up. Thanks so much for having me. Okay, excellent. Well, the panel's short and sweet this morning, aren't they? Um, Suchitra is, of course, our question master for today, Suchitra Jacob. She's joining us from the IT city of Bangalore in southern India. Welcome back, Suchitra. Um, great to see you again. Hi, Nick. Hi to the pandas and, of course, our viewers. And I can see a lot of questions already in Slido, so, yeah, can't wait to start asking them. 
All right. OK, now, if you've got a question for the panel and you're joining us online, I can see you all joining. So it's really, really great to welcome you. We're going to come and do some shout outs in a few moments if you're joining on social. So do let us know your name and the city from where you're joining. Um, so, Chitra, in the meantime, let's have our first question to the panel, please. Of course. So our first question is from Sharon Paul, who asks, how can someone with little to no experience in project management get started on their career path? All right. OK, now, Ron, why don't you start us off with this and then we'll go to Ashish. Um, it's an exact same question as somebody asked. How do you get started as a change manager? Um, to be honest, you already probably undertake projects and don't even know it. You know, you probably do things um you know in and around your home and stuff like that that requires a few days to do or a couple of weeks or whatever whether you know um you're a builder type or whatever you actually do projects already so if you've already got that mindset that's the start i think um from there on in obviously if you've got a, a an interest in project management it's then all about starting to um you know make yourself aware of what project management is all about what they need to do, what kind of mindset they need to have and so forth, and then gradually move yourself forward. It's not an overnight thing. Project manager is a very important role. So it's a gradual move towards becoming a full-blown project manager. So training and, 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 and you're learning, et cetera. Um, I don't know how long it'd take you, and I'm not even going to guess, but uh, I'll, leave you, I'll leave you for that one to think. OK, well, thank you very much, Sean. It's some great advice there, really. I think sometimes we can be, you know, early career particularly, we're in an awful hurry, aren't we, you know, to try and get to, you know, the pinnacle of things. But it's always a blend of uh, learning and experience, I think, um, to be able to do. Um, Ashish, let's hear your thoughts, please, and then we'll go to Gregory. Uh, you know, loved uh, how Ron kind of introduced it, right? Everybody does do project management in their daily life without even realizing, right? So you're planning a holiday. There's a lot of project management that goes into it, right? You're booking tickets, you you know, figuring out, first of all, where are you going, right? So a lot of stuff happens without even you realizing. But professionally, I think as you move into project management, you start small. You start understanding what is it that you're wanting to do and why you want to get into it. So clarity in objectives, uh, in your own objective should be very important. And then start small, try and find uh, within your own organization, within the existing team, what you can do to contribute. And then you know, start moving uh, and learning the ropes by, uh, you know, one, doing it and then supplementing that with some small training. Right? So project management as a role, I think, is an evolution. Uh, you continue to learn more and more about it because you learn how to see the risks. You learn how to preempt the risks from happening, right? And then you find ways and means of kind of tracking them and tracing them all down and putting the whole story together. Uh, and at the end, right, I think project management is not just about managing a sequence of events, but also looking to see what is it that you're looking to achieve, right? What's your end objective? What's the value that you're bringing on? to the entire chain uh, of, uh, of work that the team is doing. I think that's where you differentiate yourself and you, you know, go beyond just being a task organizer uh, as opposed to being a project manager. Yeah, it's the difference between having the label and living yeah. the life, I think. You know, so, yeah, absolutely right. Thanks so much, Ashish. Uh, Gregory, your thoughts? Then we'll go to Christine. <clears throat> yeah, I think I definitely agree with Ron and Ashish as well. Um, we're saying that majority of people do actually manage projects and are are involved with projects, even if their organization doesn't have something like a project manager or somebody that has the title of a project manager. Um, I think quite often you might see that some people are a project manager uh, in their organization, but you know you will find somebody else working in a different organization that that actually performs the role of a project manager more than that person does with the title. Um, I think a, a great way to get into the industry, though, is there are a lot of learning and development opportunities, not not just with people in your organization, um, people outside of the groups, associations. Uh, there's a lot of learning opportunities for people to, to kind of learn the more outlining uh, methodologies, if you want to call it that, with how to get into project management. So I think it, it really is one of those uh, professional sectors you if you want to call it that or industries that you really can bridge into um even if you didn't start out there 
Thank you very much indeed. It's it's um it's a hat really, isn't it? It's a role that we we often wear in organisations, even if our job title isn't exactly you know project manager. We're often performing the role um, almost as part of our daily work. So thank you very much indeed, Gregory. Uh, Christine, your thoughts, and we we'll go to Laurie. Yeah, I think my fellow panelists have said almost everything there is to say on this, and I agree with all of them. I always say to the young project managers or colleagues coming up in the organizations I've been leading that project management is more of a trade than a science. It's more like learning to be a good carpenter than being a PhD in physics. It's a it's a skill that you learn by being in the projects and then adding training. It's not something you can go to the uh, university and uh, study. It's something where you have to be out in the real world, in the real projects, and then supplement with uh, bouts of training. That's the best way to get started. Um, I love that, Christina, um, the, that phrase, project management is more a trade than just a science, you know, and you have to kind of build up the, you know, that over a period of time. Um, really good um, counsel. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, Laurie, final thoughts on this, please. Well, I agree with every, everything that's been said uh, so far. I think one, one element I would add is as part of that learning process to build your network. So um, really try to grow your network. Firstly, it's going to help you learn a lot because a lot of what happens in project management isn't necessarily written down in textbooks. So to have that network is going to be very useful to you. And then even when you do become a project manager, um, having a network is very, 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 very useful as well. So network as much as possible. Um, one easy way to network is to tap into professional associations like APM in the UK or PMI which is a, a global network based from the US. Both of those organisations have a very engaged project management community who um, nine times out of 10, uh, people are very, very happy to, to mentor, to support you, particularly if you're early in your career path. Yeah, absolutely. That's a great advice, actually, as well. Just think about those groups, whether they're mm -hmm. online and informal on LinkedIn or alternatively, you know, the professional associations. I think sometimes social media can be fantastic. It can connect you instantly, but you're not always necessarily um, connecting with best practice. You're just connecting with whoever is happens to be online at the time. So um, do as ever. <laughs> Not everything, not everything is to be trusted on social media. Um, but nonetheless, you know, colleagues are usually very generous with their time and, and their support and their mentoring um, if you are earlier in your career. Okay, very good. Thank you very much indeed, panel. Let's jump over to social and see who we have um, joining us today. Uh, Assange um, is joining us. Um, uh, thank you so much indeed. Uh, joining us from Nigeria. Great to have you. Um, part of the audience today, and Adira, uh, Adara, rather, I do apologise, um, a regular viewer. Um, she's also joining from Nigeria, this time in Abuja. So um, brilliant to have you online again, Adara. Looking forward to some of your questions. You're always uh, really on the money. Um, Abdul uh, joins us from Bangladesh. It'd be great to hear from you, my friend. Um, thank you so much for tuning in, um, either via LinkedIn or via YouTube. And um, we'll take one more. And uh, Mayiwa, Mayiwa, thank you so much. Uh, she's actually joining from uh, London, and actually is um, open for work as well. By the looks of by the looks of that <laughs> little icon. Um, so um, by all means, you know, if you're looking for talent, um, then uh, do see uh, Mayiwa's uh, LinkedIn profile. All right, and let's see if we can't connect. Um, somebody that needs some help with somebody who's offering some help today. Who knows? That might just work out. All right, very good. Sachitra, I can see that we've got lots of questions coming in. Now, if you're in the audience online, put your question in and then it will come through to Sachitra and she'll get it ready to present to the panel. Sachitra, next question, please. Sure. So we have another question which sort of leads on from the previous one, which is from Rob Lewis. What advice do you have for mid-career professionals looking to transition into project management from another field? All right. Okay. So a little bit different stage in the professional journey. <clears throat> um, Christina, why don't you start us off with this one and then we'll go to Ashish. I think the answer we gave to the 
first question about how to get started in project management apply 90% to the same. It doesn't really matter where you are in your career. But I think I want to challenge the way the question is asked into project management from another field. There are projects in all kinds of fields. Mm -hmm. There are projects in finance, in engineering, in construction, in IT. Mm -hmm. So the best way to start your first project is within the area of your expertise. So your engineer, start an engineering project. Mm -hmm. If you are in IT, start with an IT project. And once you've built your comfort level and confidence in projects where you are also the subject matter expert, then you can try your hands on a project. That's what I did. The first couple of projects was something that I knew something about in the policy area. And then I got handed my first IT project. And I don't know the ups and downs of a computer, but that was the real litmus test of whether project management was a discipline in of itself. But you need to build your experience and confidence within the field that you originally come from. Nobody comes from project management. So I want to challenge the way that the question is um, is asked, but I'd love to hear from my fellow panelists if they agree uh, about, the, if they agree to that analysis. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, you're so right. If you are, if you're in the situation where you understand the technicalities, the terms, the language, the methods, the approach and so on, and also the regulatory constraints within a particular function of a business, then you just need to learn the project management element when you're trying to learn both at the same time. That can be that can be sometimes a little bit more um, tricky. Thank you so much, indeed. Ashish, your thoughts, please. Then we'll go to Laurie. Oh, I absolutely agree with Christina. I think that's what I had in my mind when I was looking at the question. That uh, if you're kind of migrating and you want to move into project management, the first step really should be do it in your own uh, field, right? Because that's where you are an SME. So absolutely, I think that's where you should start. Uh, it's always been a question and I, you know, in some of the previous sessions also, I think this question has come up that uh, can you actually move from one field to another and still do project management, right? So to Christina's point, is it really a discipline? And, and yeah, I, it kind of the verdict goes both ways uh, every time, right? Because it is indeed a discipline, but I think being a subject matter does help you because you understand the nuances. But at the same time, when you when you are in the discipline, you are so structured in terms of how it has to happen that you understand the nuances of the uh, of the field by itself, right? Because you know when to ask the right question, you know, you know what are the pitfalls, what is it that you should be looking around even if you're not from the same subject area. So, I mean, yes, you start from your own discipline and, you know, on your own subject area and then move into the discipline. That kind of just helps you uh, become an, uh, an all-round professional. Okay, thank you so much indeed. Uh, Laurie, your thoughts, then we'll go to Gregory. <laughs> yes, I, well, firstly, I agree the, uh, the path of least resistance is a is a great way to go. So starting off somewhere you're familiar. Um, other points I would add, so maybe, you know, if you're from a, like an operations management type area or a strategic business case area or something like that, maybe um, just do a bit of a gap analysis. So have a look at some of the project management bodies of knowledge um, identify areas where you are strong and maybe some areas where, where it is quite new. If you, you, know, you may not have used a work breakdown structure before, things like that. So just explore where your weaknesses are and make a conscious process to try to upskill uh, in those areas. But uh, I have no doubt if you're a mid-career, you'll find that you've uh, inherently picked up a lot of the project management skills that tend to be used. There might just be differences in terminology and some of those sorts of things. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's such an important thing to be able to keep that mind open, isn't it? And think about how that terminology might vary. Um, Christina, you wanted to add something. Yeah, I just wanted to add it to what Asis is saying. I agree that being a subject matter expert in the beginning of your project management career is a very big advantage. But I want to challenge the fact that I've been a so-called non-competent project manager in, in many projects. And the fact that you're not a subject matter expert actually also brings some advantages 
uh, one of the most important is that you don't go down the rabbit holes, that you don't get bogged down in the details, but you're able to stay in the helicopter, uh, helicopter perspective. And especially when you move into larger projects or even programs, I've actually found it an advantage to not be able to know the details. Then you need a good technical lead. But uh, so so going into project management and actually trying to do a project in a field where you're not an expert, it really sharpens your people skills and your project management skills because you can't revert to your comfort zone. So I want to uh, put that out as a challenge to anyone who's done a couple of projects in their field to try uh, to go uh, outside because it is a very exciting experience. Absolutely right. Thank you very much indeed. So it's so important to swim within your lane, isn't it? And to understand the difference between being the subject matter expert, the technical expert, if you like, and also the project manager. Um, Gregory, your thoughts, please. Then we'll go to Ron. Yeah, just I just want to tie in with something that Christina said right in the beginning, which is quite often people have the perception with moving into project management. Um, you know, they have this idea that they're looking to move from the field they're currently in into a brand new one. And that can seem quite daunting. Um, you know, uh, looking at from a perspective of our organization, quite often people think, you know, they might be coming from a finance background. And they're the moment they're looking to move into project management, they immediately think, oh, it's construction. You know, I'm moving into some kind of, like there's this one ideal field where project management is just really successful. However, that's really not the case. Um, there's a lot of doors and a lot of opportunities in every single industry to become a project manager. Um, and really what I'd say is look at what organizations are looking for. Look at the qualifications you have. Look at the hard skills they want you to have and surround yourself with the people and the training to, to get into that. Okay, thank you very much indeed. Ron, your thoughts on this? Yeah, there's a saying that said that goes, look before you leap. You've got to make, excuse me, I won't say it, but you've got to make sure that what you're getting yourself into is really actually what you want. Do you want to be a project manager in a different field or do you want to be someone in a different field rather than a project manager? Or do you want to be someone in a specific field? There's a whole host of things that are going on there. Um, I mean, we don't know the reason why the question was asked, yeah, because, um, you know, if we did know the reason, yes, we'd have probably a lot, a lot more detailed answer. But it really is, you've got to make sure this is what you want to do, because it's a big step to take, yeah, and it depends on it, what, 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 what kind of field you're working in at the moment and how big a leap it's going to be and how long it's going to take. Thank you very much indeed, Ron. I think, you know, that look before you leap advice is um, is really good for you. Um, one thing that I would suggest to you if you're mid-career is that you already have some um, flying hours, if you like. So um, when you're considering transitioning, then you, know, you have more of an opportunity to be able to do that and to look into that kind of role and that kind of life. You know, There's great visibility with being a project manager, but with that also comes the need for very strong resilience um, within you and the ability, as Christina mentioned, to maintain that helicopter view and some of the influence that you have at the moment through being a subject matter expert in your particular functional area perhaps will go away when you take on that more generic discipline of being the project manager so do consider that a little bit think about that mental uh, strength if you like the fortitude is a great word uh, in the, in the english language uh, to be able to use do you have that inner strength if you like to be able to sustain systemically you know the drive and determination that you need as a project manager just do give that a little bit of thought but what a brilliant question from rob thank you so much indeed rob for putting that to the panel um Suchitra, i can see we've got a lot of questions stacking up there so we best press on let's take our next question please we have a live question from jabulule makubo how can ai help transitioning to being a pm okay yeah. so topic which is on a lot of people's minds just right now how can ai help us and um one of the areas of course is to think about these kinds of career changes uh, laurie why don't you start us off and then we'll go to ashish 
<clears throat> yeah, so this is a, a, a really a great question. AI is really transforming everything uh, that we do uh, in society and in particular uh, project management because project management is all about change. So historically, um, we've learned over history that there's a lot of things that we tend to get wrong on projects. So we tend to underestimate them. We underestimate the schedule. We overestimate the benefits. So there's all these biases that we tend to have on projects. And by using AI in a structured way with the right checks and balances in place. Oh, I think we might have just uh, lost. Oh. I do apologise, Laurie. We, uh, oh, your go. signal was interrupted a little bit. Um, so you were kind of mid-sentence, but I think we just dropped the, the second half of your last sentence. If you could kind of rewind a little bit for us, that would be great. Yeah, so there's a, a great opportunity for AI to put guardrails in place just to help increase the chances of making the right decisions, setting our budgets properly, setting setting uh, baseline schedules correctly. So a lot of uh, opportunity for AI to help us with that. And a huge number of tools. So to, if you can ask AI the right queries, you would never use the responses verbatim, but it can certainly help provide a starting point. It can be a real time saver for templates, project management templates, and some of those sorts of things. So AI is certainly going to revolutionise project management. And if you're looking at transitioning to be a PM and to be conscious of the AI factor and the, the opportunity for AI to support you, um, it can really help help get you ahead of the curve very quickly. Yeah, thanks very much, Adia. I think you're right there. There's a lot of work, you know, looking in particular, not necessarily AI, full-blown AI, but certainly machine learning, you know, how can you automate, um, you know, some of the, what has traditionally been manual tasks, project managers hunched over with uh, PMO mm -hmm. colleagues, massive spreadsheets to add things up and take things away and produce all of that narrative reporting that's required by not just the um, stakeholders, of course, but also within the projects and the programs as well. Ashish, your thoughts on this? Then we'll go to Ron. Yeah, yeah, I, I um, kind of, like, oh, sorry, like, Ashish. Go ahead. <laughs> oh, no. Go ahead, I would probably, yeah, I would just look at the question slightly differently, right? I wouldn't say that AI can really help you into transitioning, but I would say that how can AI add value to the project management role per se? You know, that's probably how I would look look at the question and try and answer it. So when you bring in artificial intelligence or like you said, uh, machine learning, right? You kind of uh, increase the availability of the project manager from doing much more and bringing in more value in terms of how he or she is managing the projects, right? So you take away and you also relieve the PMO from uh, all of the reporting, et cetera, that has been happening. Right. And then to Laurie's point, you are also uh, able to kind of make use of standard templates. You are able to preempt some of the data points. You, you, are, you have historic information and the analytics that can be churned out for you to be able to drive uh, the insights for you. So you get better at estimation, etc. And essentially, then the project manager has more time in ensuring that the teams are organized in a more effective way and that the value that you are bringing out of those projects you know, and the end objective is coming out more and more vehemently and you're not spending your time in just organizing things or kind of re-looking at effort estimates and seeing okay what did we go wrong historically so all of that i think can help uh, in uh, in in the project management role where some of the old-fashioned project management kind of goes away and you evolve yourself as a project manager thank you very much indeed uh, ron final thoughts on this uh, I mean, Ashish has practically answered the question that's exactly the same as I was going to answer. So thank you for that. Cut mine short. Um, I'll kind of go back to my last opening statement. Look before you leave. We're in the early days of AI, okay? And we kind of know what it can do already. And there's a lot more it can do. And certainly on the project management side, in terms of things like reporting, like statistical analysis and so forth, that is going to be a great bonus for project managers. And as she said, to help them free up their time and actually manage the people rather than the technology. Um, so I just think we need to just sort of maybe take a step or two back and say, what is it, rather than trying to rush in and be the first to the post and say, hey, look what I've done with AI, et cetera, what is it actually you want to do here? 
what is we want to do what is it we want to use ai for specifically which will make the biggest impact on the job we do and i think that's important because people are just rushing into this ai i did yeah <laughs> you know, i started you know looking and stuff like that. i've now tailed off i'm now creating my own content again because i enjoy it more um so people need to think about it a bit more yeah rather than say oh look i'm the first to do this or i'm the first to do that yeah, I, I think you're right. There was a lot of hype around the launch of a number of large language models, and that uh, really led to an explosion of commentary, not just in the um, uh, general press around the world, but also in the professional publications and so on, and people looking at how it might be leveraged into different disciplines. Uh, Laurie, you just wanted to add something, then we're going to move on. Uh, yeah, just, just something else that I would add is um, earlier on I mentioned networking and finding mentors. Um, a conversational generational AI like ChatGPT is an opportunity to be a virtual mentor for you. So if you tell them a little bit about yourself, the types of projects you're getting involved with, you know, you've never done a quality management plan before or whatever the issue is you're confronted with, you can ask questions. And once again, um, you, do, you always want to do your due diligence on the responses. But it is uh, quite remarkable um, the quality of the uh, the information, the feedback you can get from a tool as simple as ChatGPT. Yeah, thank you very much indeed. One thing that I would suggest is um, do your homework so that you can learn different prompts. Um, uh, re re recently, I discovered that you could ask for the answers back in a tabular format, which is pretty useful, isn't it, um, for you to be able to use in certain circumstances. If you're providing um, narrative reporting, for example, um, that can be jolly useful and a very useful uh, time saver from the narrative style conversations in inverse commas that I was previously having with various large language models. By the way, other ones are available other than chat GPT. All right, well, let's um, take social. Uh, I can see we've got quite a big audience today. Um, so thank you very much, uh, Jabalele. Thank you for that um, question, actually, that you've just submitted. Great question and uh, highly relevant for today. Joining us from Johannesburg in South Africa, of course. And we also have um, uh, Drek, who's joining us from Uganda. Uh, great to have you online, my friend. Uh, it'd be great to see some questions from you coming into the panel in a few moments or so. Um, finally, on this section, uh, let's um, give a shout out to Gwen. Um, Gwen is joining from Surrey here in the UK. So great to have you as part of the audience today. When. All right, very good. Let's move on to Chitra. We'll take our next question to the panel, please. Our next question is from Nick. What advice would the panel give to project managers who need to reduce the time to value on their projects and deliver better outcomes? Okay, now I put this one into try and kind of test, test the panel a little bit, if you like, because wherever you are in your career, if you're volunteering as a project manager, if you're early career, if you're mid career, late career, and so on, this is something which we're being asked to do all the time. You know, can we go faster? Can we deliver smarter? Can we deliver better? Um, and so on and so on, and often with constrained or limited resource. Now, Christina, I know that this is your lifelong field of expertise. So with your patience panel, I'd like to go to Christina first, okay? And then we can learn a little bit from her as well and add in our own thinking. Christina, off we go. Thank you. Yes, this is what um, the Half Double uh, Institute is all about, uh, is why it's called that, so half is to deliver value in half the time and double is the double outcome. And and all my panelists uh, know this uh, probably from painful own, own experience that only about 30 to 35% of projects are successful. And I don't think any other industry would be happy with such an outcome. So uh, I think as a profession, uh, we should really think about these two questions and how to do better. Um, one of the mistakes that I see uh, are the most common in project managers, even experienced project managers, is they get too focused and bogged down on the deliverable. Uh, 
and they forget to look at the purpose and the outcome. So shifting your focus a little bit from the deliverables to the outcome is certainly a way to make sure that you deliver uh, value to your uh, constituents. Um, reduce the time. Uh, one of the things that actually the, the pandemic that we experienced uh, really hindered is I'm a big believer in co-location. I'm a big believer in visual planning and people getting together and not waiting for another email to come in. So any time that you can, um, and also a another big mistake in organizations is that people are distributed across too many projects. Uh, that really reduces efficiency in each project. So if you can get the allocation up for each project participant and you can try to work in the same room, whether virtually or physically, and uh, I hate these big Gantt charts. I love uh, good uh, paper on the wall or something else that's much more visually appealing. Uh, when a project manager puts up a big Gantt chart for me, I immediately fall asleep. So, so something else is needed. So I think there are some levers that we can do, but it, uh, it does require some, uh, some thinking. And I think this is the greater challenge, greatest challenge that the project management community has at the moment. So. I'll stop the preaching <laughs> and, and leave it to my fellow <clears throat> not at fellow uh, panelists. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I didn't take it as preaching at all. I, I took it as, you know, really from the heart, all right, authentic coaching. You know, this is absolutely the heart of the matter. Why have a project manager? Why can't people just do it on their own? Well, they can't do it on their own. And empirically, we found that they can't do it on their own. And actually, they can do it a lot better if you follow some guidance, <laughs> you follow some of these frameworks. And the half double institute has empirical evidence all right which is something often that stakeholders ask you before you begin something can you prove it all right before you begin on this path can you prove it well actually the short answer is yes and there's a qr code for there for you on the screen folks so if you're thinking about a career in project management this is at the heart of the matter this is in the true sense of the word the radical thought for you all right right at the heart of the matter as a project manager it's about delivering greater value than otherwise would have been derived just simply from the individuals and the time scale provided so thank you very much christina for starting us off laurie let's go to you next you do an awful lot of this and in construction and engineering i can't imagine a client has ever come to you asking for greater value in less time surely that never happened <laughs> it's it's always the way. Unfortunately, too often it happens late in the project. So I agree with completely with Christina. Uh, front end loading is the term that's commonly used in engineering construction projects, and the idea is you want that diverse, diverse, inclusive approach. You want the different disciplines of technical expertise involved early, so the earlier all of those good ideas are thought of, bounced off. You know, you can really optimize the value of a project and compress the delivery. Unfortunately, that involves investment of time. So it's almost like sometimes you have to slow down at the front in order to speed up uh, at the back end of the project. So um, yeah, certainly front end loading. And I would add that um, there has never been a better time to do that with a historical database. So if you can have a good historical database of your projects and um, overlay that with machine learning, and a conversational interface similar to ChatGPT or something like that, you can imagine how much you can accelerate that front-end loading process in your projects as well. So it's a very exciting time to be delivering twice the value in half the time. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Laurie. Um, Ashish, your thoughts? And we'll hear from Gregory. Right. And I kind of uh, you know love that idea of having AI and ML, right? And that kind of alludes to the previous question that we had. Now, this is where... Uh, you know, AI and ML can actually ha help you deliver more and faster because you're not really doing that analytics and you're not kind of going back and trying to see, okay, what do I need? Because that is already being provided to you from historical information. So that's one area which I think is definitely helpful in help, you know, in getting more in less time. And second, when we look at these projects, uh, you know, one of the things is that 
most project managers take it as a task and they kind of keep orienting towards the everybody towards a task that has to be accomplished right there's a deliverable like christina was saying i think what we need to reorient ourselves is towards the end objective why are we doing this project what is the outcome that we are looking for once you orient yourself to that end state you know the entire team kind of follows through so you're not just you're looking at completing tasks but you're also trying to see okay what is the outcome and that's when you start looking at alternatives think out of the box to be able to deliver faster right and i think that's the change in mindset that we need uh, you know project managers to have that start looking at the objective start looking at the value right up front and not looking at as a sequence of tasks that will take you somewhere yeah such an important part to keep our minds open and to learn both from the experience of when things have not worked well but also be open to doing things differently in the future so that you can add greater value and um, deliver more effectively uh, gregory your thoughts and then we'll go to ron yeah i mean th this is an extremely difficult one i'd say looking at it from a from a bit of a different industry like uh, coming from an NGO, NPO perspective, um, this is a really tricky one because, you know, quite often there are time constraints. People want all the value, but the funding is very limited. And I mean, that, that happens in every single industry, every organization. However, I think, like Christina said, a huge thing that, that gets lost is communication, um, especially with projects happening globally across the board um, where funding becomes an issue. Uh, and I feel Quite often what happens is due to lack of communication and wanting delivery of the project within time, within scale. Um, in the end, what gets lost midway through the project is actually the value, the whole the whole reason of why it's happening um, and the people it's happening for. Um, you know, and I, I think that's that's probably something that needs to be discussed with all the stakeholders involved, project managers, um, and probably what everybody needs to look at, you know, is coming back to the, to the actual value for the people involved. Yeah, you really do see that, don't you? Particularly with those projects which, by their nature, you know, have to be delivered over a longer period of time, that you have a huge amount of energy and enthusiasm and commitment at the beginning, and then over time that will naturally kind of wane. So being able to maintain that level of engagement, reach out to, you know, new volunteers who can actually add value into the delivery of that project or program, and the way in which it's out comes are being managed and measured uh, is very very important to sustaining you know the value that was originally envisaged you only get benefits after doing something <laughs> you rarely get the benefit beforehand you might have the vision you know the vision may be brilliant okay but the benefits are going to be realized sometime afterwards and that requires all of that horsepower to actually get it done uh, ron final thoughts on this please yeah, this is this is a whole big debate about getting things done quicker. I think Christine mentioned something about thirty to thirty-five percent of projects failing, which you know I'm uh, probably not in agreement with. I'm in fact I'm having a tirade against all percentages now on LinkedIn because I think they're rubbish. Um, but isn't that the problem? Isn't isn't the problem that you're pushing people to get things done faster? Yeah, because of the value issue. And because of that, they miss things and they're more likely to fail. Isn't that the problem, really? Yeah. Um, or the other problem is that you underestimate complexity at the beginning. You don't allow enough time because the powers that be, steering board, sponsor, whoever, wants his benefits delivered quicker than they were. You know, for. And benefits is another big issue. Benefits probably don't accrue until a lot longer after the project is finished. And one of the problems you have, you have is the project manager who finishes the project at go live and doesn't actually carry on trying to deliver the benefits because they want their next project. So it's left up to the poor change manager to manage the benefits through to whenever. <laughs> so there's a whole host uh, of things around, and, and, and I'm trying to sort of, you know, sort of encapsulate them. But um, yeah, failure. What's failure? You. What's success? 
Okay, well, we, we might do that on another show, actually. What is, what <laughs> constitutes, um, you know, the good, the bad, and uh, is there an ugly in project management? Well, there may be. Um, some projects are not quite as beautifully formed as others, perhaps. But there we go. Um, some great answers, panel. And the reason, as I mentioned to you, of asking that question is that it is something which is, I think, part of um, everybody's, you know, career aspiration, uh, whatever project size and scale and complexity you're actually managing to do that so thank you very much indeed for your insight panel really do appreciate it so tutor time is against us so we're going to have to pick up the pace a little let's take our next question for the panel please we would like a question from gwen benson what is your opinion on starting as a contractor in project management on short projects to enable improvement of skills and experience in the car Okay, um, contracting uh, is uh, an interesting way to kind of, you know, begin getting into this. A little bit of a baptism of fire, perhaps. Laurie, um, briefly, what are your thoughts on this? And then we'll hear from Ron. Uh, thank you for the question, Gwen. I think you've actually answered the question with your question. So in, in my view, one of the best ways to get your project management skills running is to do lots of short-term contracts, often as a contractor. So um, as a contractor, you'll usually get thrown the most difficult things that no one wants to do. Um, if, if they're smaller projects or short projects, you're going to get to see the whole project life cycle again and again. So you get that learning experience as opposed to being on one long project where you may not really uh, learn that much. So um, that, that really is a, a great experience, um, the one that you're describing there. There may be some gaps, so you might want to have um, like an overall perspective of what happens to the asset and the benefits phase. So you may not see as much as that, but overall in terms of learning or giving value to you in a short time frame from a learning experience, it sounds like you're on a good path. Thank you very much indeed. Um, let's go to Ron and then we'll hear from Gregory. Yeah, very quickly. I was on the contract market between 1969 and 2019. So I'd been on there a fair while. Okay? And doing short, sharp projects of six months, nine months, a year or whatever is great because you can see an end in sight is the first thing. Yeah, You know, the vision has been set and you can actually see it because it's not that far away. It's not a two or three year long ERP implementation or whatever. Um, and you can deliver, you know, the time scale. You, I mean, you know, the time scale you have to deliver anyway when you've got your project plan. But certainly on a contract, you know, when your contract ends, you know, when you get stock game paid. So, you know, you have to deliver by that time. And it's a great way of skipping between industry se sectors and st skipping between different technologies if you want and stuff like that. And you grab all of that experience. So, you know, on the contract market, let's say for five years, yeah, six months projects within that five years, you've got 10 years worth, yeah? Oh, that's the wrong Thank calculation. You, so <laughs> you know what I mean. <laughs> you know what I we mean. We do. You're, you're, packing, you're packing a great deal into a shorter you're period packing of time. Great deal. understand that. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, Gregory, final thoughts, then we're going to move on. Um, I think... Quickly, uh, I think it has pros and cons. We're in the our organizations in the fortunate position where you see a lot of people transitioning um, from one career into the next one, and majority of them think contracting is going to be the easiest way to get into project management. And I'd probably say, if you are looking to go down that interview uh, or down that avenue, then then really you should know it's going to be a baptism by fire. Um, it's probably not going to be the root of least resistance. Um, however, there are pros to it, meaning, as as Laurie and, and Ron has said, you are going to learn a lot more in a shorter period of, of time. Okay, thank you very much indeed. Um, just uh, to counter all of that good stuff, um, often in the contracting world, you're hired on the basis of whatever it was that you did last time. So you may become typecast a little, um, in your contracting career, um, perhaps working in a particular vertical industry, uh, financial services or in you know insurance or construction and so on, you may find it actually difficult to break out of that. The other thing that I would say is that 
organizations often find it tricky to invest in skill development, professional development for their contractors. So do allow yourself some downtime between engagements so that you can build that professional development yourself. Um, Otherwise, you may find that actually you are just simply playing the same tune on the same fiddle and breaking the strings over time as they wear out. All right, let's move on um, and we'll take our final question for today. So our last question for today is from Katrina. Are there specific industry associations or groups that project managers should consider joining? All right, okay. So um, membership bodies, uh, groups, um, communities, these kinds of things. What are our thoughts? Well, I'm going to start us off um, here. I would certainly look at um, your local project management association uh, named differently in different countries in the uk it's called the association for project management or the apm if you like in other countries they often have different um initializations uh laurie what are your thoughts and then we'll go to christina uh yes <laughs> so so i uh, agree with your comment so ones that i've had uh, exposure to as apm in the uk And they were um, certainly fantastic. I wasn't specifically looking to enhance my career prospects at the time, but I have no doubt that they would be able to help you there. The Project Management Institute is an excellent um, project management association as well that have chapters around the world. And I know in our local chapter here, they have career clubs and some of those sorts of things. So lots of, um, and even aside from a dedicated focus on careers prospects, just the net, uh, the networking and that sort of thing you do by osmosis, um, you're more than likely to open up doors for uh, career opportunities and things like that. So, yeah, the answer is yes. Just just look for one, look for one that best sort of fits with you and the sorts of things that you like to do. Uh, and uh, yeah, I think more than likely you'll 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 find it helps you. Okay, excellent. Thank you very much um, indeed, Laurie, Christina, and then we'll go to Ashish. Yes, I agree with. What uh, uh, Laurie said, looking for these local associations is a good idea. In Denmark, we also have the Association of Danish Project Management. That's a good place to start if you find yourself in Denmark, which not many people do. So uh, it's a small country. Um, uh, But I also, there there are groups on LinkedIn, for instance, where you can um, follow discussions. And of course, uh, these uh, uh, shows are a great way to get into it, but I, I want to say nothing will really replace maybe that first training that you go to, just with not just to listen to the trainers, but also to listen to other people who participate in the training. Uh, you'll build your network uh, from there. Remember again, um, it's a trade, not a science. So getting hands-on experience, getting hands-on training would be my first step rather than uh, immediately uh, joining an association. One doesn't exclude the other. I would just say if, if I was young to this industry, I would... Um, I would try to find a project and some training as my first two moves and then associations as my third. Okay, thank you very much indeed, uh, Christina. Um, uh, Denmark, though, is a a fascinating country. More than 1,400 islands from memory make up um, the country of Denmark. So um, joining people together, building bridges, bringing communities together is really at the heart of Danish society, in in my humble experience of having worked with some Danish people. So from that perspective, I think that sense of community, professional community is very strong. Might be a small country, but it punches above its weight, certainly in intellectual property. So thank you, Christina. Um, Ashish, your thoughts, and then Ron? No, I kind of, uh, Laurie and Christian have covered quite a bit, right, I think. So, uh, you know, nothing kind of supersedes the other. You kind of have to do everything all together, find your projects, uh, network within your own community, within the own location that you're in, uh, within your own organization. I think that's the first step, right? See if you have a project management practice, you know, talk to fellow project managers, see what they're doing and follow your own. And today, every organization typically has their own, uh, kind of a Twitter, so to say, or a WhatsApp group, right? So a lot of those are available. So start looking around. 
and uh, attend a few trainings right when you attend yeah. in person trainings or even virtually you get to connect with people local as well as globally and then kind of that just broadens your horizon so i think uh, you know start looking small steps and you'll get there i'm sure okay thanks very much indeed Ashish. ron final thoughts on this yeah, it's a bit like the previous question about contracting and, and doing short term short term contracts. Um, it's exactly the same as although you don't join a, a professional group for short term, short you kind of join it for long term. But it's about getting together with people, your peers, your colleagues and stuff like that, and understanding things from them, learning from them. Obviously, from a contract, it's from, it's from a different perspective, it's from a work perspective, from, but from a, an association or group, it's from a, another perspective. Again, it's more from a professional perspective. And it's also about you know getting, getting to know who the right people are that you need to speak to about whatever, whatever it is you want to speak to. There'll always be someone in um, an association, one of the chapters or whatever, that is the more knowledgeable that's been kicking around for years and years, a bit like me. Um, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> um, but that's probably the best thing. Yes, absolutely. Join a, join a, a, an association and network. Thank you very much indeed, Ron. Excellent. Well, thank you for some brilliant questions um, today, everybody, to our producers who are online. Um, really great um, work. Uh, we had some fantastic questions from everybody, so we thank you for that. We didn't quite get through everybody's questions, um, so we're going to carry those forward All right, uh, to the next session. Um, let's hear our closing remarks now from the panel. Laurie, we're going to come to you first, then we'll go to Ashish. Oh, just uh, thank you, everyone, for a, uh, a great panel discussion. I think there's never been a more important time for project management, so I really enjoyed uh, the answers, and I learned a lot from you. And particular, in particular, congratulations, uh, Christina and Gregory. I thought your contribution was amazing, so it was really, really fun being on the panel with you. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much indeed, Ashish. Um, your thoughts, and then we'll go to Christina. Absolutely amazing, uh, you know, good conversations and some great questions about AI and uh, value to the projects, right? So it's always amazing to come on these uh, panels to learn so many different perspectives from everybody from different industries. So absolutely had fun. Thank you very much indeed, Christina and then Ron. Yes, I want to thank you for letting me into this panel. I love the fact that we're spread all over the world and uh, we have so many similar experiences. It truly shows that project management is a global uh, discipline. And I also agree with the fact that it is a global challenge. If we can just imagine being 10 to 20 percent better at uh, executing projects all over the world, Imagine what we can contribute to the uh, energy crisis and the uh, global uh, warming crisis. So it's an imperative that we need to deliver better projects in a shorter time to make sure the, the globe survives. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you so much, Christina. Could not have phrased it better. Uh, Ron and then Gregory. Yeah, I do enjoy enjoy joining these sessions that are not really my core expert uh, area of expertise because I learned something as well and I hope I don't know obviously because I you know answer the questions I hope because I give my answer from a maybe slightly different perspective it provides a different viewpoint for the listeners there. So, you know, maybe if my answer is coming from the perspective of change manager and we're talking about a project manager, there may be something that's different in there that might just click with people. So that's why I enjoy coming on these. Absolutely. Thank you very much indeed, Ron. And um, I'm, I'm sure that you're right. Uh, Gregory and then Suchitra. Yeah, I just want to say thank you so much for having me on the session today. Thank you to, to all the panelists. Um, no, I've, I've also learned a lot today, um, so I'm sure that everybody joining the session um, has has as well. Um, and really appreciative to to APMG, like you and Chichitra for for hosting these, um, giving people the opportunity to really upskill. You're welcome. Thanks very much indeed for joining, Gregory. Um, Suchitra, your reflections on today. 
It's been a great show, and thank you to the panelists, and uh, especially Christina and Gregory on your first show. And of course, our viewers, we have so many live questions still pending, and surely we'll take them up in the next episode. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Well, thank you very much, panel. On behalf of our producers, who, of course, are, are our online audience, they're the ones who drive the show. It's their questions that um, make the show happen. So thank you very much, indeed, for being here and giving them all such brilliant value in your answers. Um, if you did submit a question and it was selected, then watch out for your name, folks, in the credits at the end of the show. Um, and uh, well done to everybody. OK, now moving on on our website, you can, of course, search for the answers to now more than 2000 actually questions. Um, it's a free resource that connects you with experts from all over the world. Um, and do jump in and explore that. Don't forget that you can also listen to the audio versions of the shows on your preferred podcast platform as well. Coming up on Level Up later on this week, Friday the 29th, we're going to be exploring how to become a NIST cybersecurity professional before returning to the world of projects and with how to become a PMO specialist on Monday the 2nd of October. If you're interested, in modern approaches to service management, then do join us the following Friday, that's the 6th of October, uh, 2 p.m. UK time, as we explore careers in that popular discipline. Ask us, of course, and we will send you a personal summary of what's coming up and how you too can join us here on the panel and level up your career with APMG. Thanks very much, everybody. We'll see you next time.